I've made videos about several Goan FPGA development boards made by Cypede. A viewer commented about another board, the Kiwi 1P5, made by One Kiwi. This board is very inexpensive and simple, so I decided to buy one. This video is about this board and how to get started with it using the Goan FPGA tools. This time I'll focus on running the tools under Windows. Frankly and unfortunately, the Goan tools work with far less trouble on Windows than they do on Linux. What's on this board? First, there is the Goan GW1N UV1P5 FPGA and a 27 MHz oscillator to give it a clock. The oscillator properly connects to an FPGA global clock pin. Next, we see a USB-C connector for powering the board and programming the FPGA. There is a USB to JTAG bridge chip connected to FPGA pins for this. There is also a dip switch that allows this board to program external Go and FPGAs by means of JTAG pins on the board. I won't test this. And then we see two push buttons and two LEDs. These connect to FPGA pins so your FPGA project can use them. Finally, there is a separate USB to serial port bridge connected to FPGA pins and a separate USB-C connector for this. Yes, this means you need two separate USB cables connected to your computer if you want to both program the FPGA and have a serial port. Note that both USB-C connectors supply power to the board. Compared to Tang Nano boards with Go and FPGAs, there is very little on this board. That's good if you need unencumbered board pins, but bad if you like the extra stuff on the Tang Nano boards. Let's compare the Kiwi 1P5 to those Tang Nano boards. The Kiwi 1P5 is very inexpensive and is the cheapest of the boards. I'm showing USA Amazon prices, including shipping, but you should also check other sources like AliExpress. In particular, the recent Amazon price for the Tang Nano 4K is very high. I paid much less when I bought one. Who can say what effect the USA tariffs are having on these prices at this time? Still, all of these boards are inexpensive as FPGA development boards go. That's what makes them good for hobbyists or people who just want to learn about FPGAs but are not doing serious product development. In line with its price, the Kiwi 1P5 has far fewer FPGA resources compared to the other boards. I'm using the LUT4 count as a proxy for this. This means that the Kiwi 1P5 supports only smaller FPGA projects. I think it's big enough for learning about FPGAs, but you could get a lot farther with the Tang Nano 9K or 20K. So what are these boards best for? The Kiwi 1P5 is best at being cheap while having a good number of unencumbered pins. It's good if you want to dabble with FPGAs, perhaps for the first time, without significant cost. The Tang Nano 4K has an ARM Cortex-M3 hardcore and other standard ARM IP. It's great for learning about and experimenting with these things if that's your goal. Otherwise, look at the Tang Nano 9K. This board has a great balance of price and features. The Tang Nano 20K's advantage is its capacity for larger projects. Note that some people use the Tang Nano 9K and 20K for retro gaming. They can also make use of their video connectors and SD card slots, things that are entirely absent on the Kiwi 1P5. Now, let's see how to get started with the Kiwi 1P5. These steps will be similar for the Tang Nano boards. To get the Go in tools, you have to use a browser and go to goinseme.com slash en slash and make an account if you don't have one and then log in. And then go to products, go in EDA. EDA is the tools. And so we go to here and we say download go in EDA and it comes up with tabs for Windows and for Linux, and today we want Windows. And you've basically got two choices here. You can either use the full edition, this, this one here, or use the education edition. If you use the full edition, you'll have to also click on this apply for license thing and fill out a form and they'll send you a license after a while, which you can use to activate the tools. And I think you might have to repeat that annually, but I'm not sure. And for today, we can use the license-free education version. So I'm going to click here, and I think it should start to download. And that will take a while, so we'll wait for it to download. And now that's done, so we'll switch Windows and run the downloaded installer. All right, here's my download section. And so now I'm going to extract this, I guess just to right here. And that should take a little bit of time. Okay, 
And now I can go ahead and run the installer. And that might take a little bit of time to open, perhaps because my computer's doing a virus check, I'm not sure. But there we go. And now we just have to go through the a normal setup. So if I accept, do I have to read all this? I agree. Go in and go in programmer. Next. C colon go in is fine. Install. And we just wait for this to complete. And that took a couple of minutes, but it finished. So now I click this and it's going to have to install the USB cable driver. So I'll say extract and just go through this one. Next, finish. And maybe something here needs my attention. Yes. Install. And that was another minute or two, but I'll say close. And I think we've installed all of the software that comes directly from Goan. You also can download these documents from the Goan website. The example guide tells how to install a Windows serial driver for the USB serial chip. There are also docs within the Tools Installation folder. The Kiwi datasheet describes pins on the board and more. I annotated this diagram from the datasheet to summarize pin use and pin numbers of the onboard resources. We need to remember pin 35 for key 1, pins 27 and 28 for the LEDs, and pin 4 for the 27 MHz CAN oscillator. All I.O. pins are 3.3 volts. Let's make this FPGA do something. So to start, we run the Go in Tools, and they'll open, and then we'll look at the version number. So you can see I have version 1.9.11.03 education build. That should work fine for us. And so now I need to make a project. So I say new and FPGA design project. And I need to give it a name. I'll call it LED count and say next. And then I have to pick the FPGA that's on our board. And so here I can go to the series GW1N and the device GW1NP5. And now there's only one choice and it happens to be the uh, XF48 uh, package. So I pick that and that should be our FPGA and say finish. And so now we have a project file and we can create a Verilog file. So let's add a, a Verilog top level file. So I'll say new Verilog file. I'm going to call it top and um, place it here and open it. I guess it was already opened. And so now I need to type in a Verilog program and watching me type is boring. So instead I'm going to paste this one. So copy, paste, and uh, make that window go away. And so now here's our Verilog program. And what we see is that we have these signals going off the FPGA. So we need an input clock, and that's on pin 4, 27 megahertz oscillator, like I said. We'll have a reset button on key 1, pin 35. And then we're going to make the LEDs sort of blink in a counting pattern. And those LEDs are on pins 27 and 28 and they're driven by this uh, two-bit register. So the way this program works is pretty simple. I have a parameter called max count that's set to 13,500,000, and this loop just causes that counter to count up. And whenever a counter reaches that max count value, it increments the LED LEDs by, by one, making them count in that counting pattern, and then it resets the counter to zero and keeps going. If you hit the reset button, it just clears these counters back to zero. So that's how our Verilog works. The next step is to synthesize the Verilog. And we do that by pressing this icon here. And it's saying maybe I should save files, so OK. And then synthesis completes. And I can see that there weren't any errors, so that's good. Now, the next thing we have to do is to assign these external signals to pins. And the way you do that is you run the floor planner. And you have to do that after synthesizing. So it doesn't have a file, so create the uh, constraints file. And we do that and bring this over here. Now we want to go to the IO constraints tab. And uh, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. So we can see more of it all at once. Okay, that's pretty good. So now what we have to do is to drag the location to the appropriate pin. So reset, remember that was on key one, which was pin 35. So we locate pin 35 over here and just drag reset 
to pin 35. And we could do this for everything else. So the LEDs were on, I think, 27 and 28. So we'll make this one 28. And this other LED, 27. And then finally, the clock was on pin 4. And so that sets that assigns the external signals to pins. Uh, these are defaulting to the wrong type. All of the banks on our on this board, on the FPGA, on this board are LBC MOS 3.3. So I said should change all of these. And so I'll, I'll do that if I can get get it to cooperate. There we go. LBS LBC MOS 3.3, right? Just like that. So now I need to repeat that for all of them. And the last one. LVC MOS. And then all of these other settings are probably okay. There's some things we don't really need, but I don't think they'll hurt anything. But there are other properties of the pins that you can set here. So once we're done with this, we can say save and make it go away. And now we should be able to do the, the whole process, including place and route. So if I click here, it'll do the place and route. But notice something red. So there was something red. That means that we haven't told the to go in tools, what the frequency of this clock is. So let's fix that. And the way we do that is by opening the, let's see, the, oh, it's over here in tools. We open the timing constraints editor and it doesn't have a SDC file. So we'll add one. And now what we need to do is to add a clock. And I need to remember how to do that. Uh, right click, create clock. And so the name of our signal is CLK, and the frequency of the clock is 27 megahertz. And then I can say add, and I click on these two little things here, and let's say search, and then we find it finds the clock signal, and I add it over to there. And say OK, OK, and so now we have a clock defined as 27 megahertz. Save that with Control S, and let's do our synthesis in place and route again. And now we see that there are no errors. So good. Now that the project's built, the next step is to program the FPGA. And I can't do that until I plug the USB cable from the FPGA into the computer. I haven't done that yet. So I'm going to reach over and do that now. And we see the power light come on. So that's good. And we're ready to go. The programmer is this icon here. So I click that. And the programmer comes up and automatically detects the FPGA. And I have to say save. It, I'm not sure it actually remembers that. But anyway, just say save when it auto detects the FPGA. And now there's two ways to program. We can either just program SRAM, which will configure the FPGA in a way that won't survive a power cycle. Or we can program its flash. But let's start out just doing the SRAM. So I click here and it programs. And so that's done. And now we can see that the LEDs are blinking in a counting pattern the way we expect. To program the FPGA's configuration into the flash, we click here and double click, I guess. And then in, instead of SRAM mode, we can pick, let's see, embedded flash mode. That's what's in this on this board and, and in this FPGA. And so I think just everything is fine. So I say save and then program again. And now it's erasing the flash programming. And we see the LEDs blink. So now I'm going to unplug the cable and plug it back in. And we should see that after I plug the cable back in, the LED should continue to blink. So unplugging and plugging back in. So that made the configuration in the FPGA permanent. I haven't covered getting the board serial port to work. I may show that in a later video. But for now, you can see that Goen recommends getting the needed USB serial driver from Zadig, which is a little weird. The example guide shows how to make the serial port work. When installing the driver, pick GWU2U and USB Serial CDC. It's disappointing that the board uses a USB serial chip that does not work out of the box for Windows. In fact, it doesn't work out of the box for Linux either. Here's the solution to that. You can pause and read it. I'll end this video here. As usual, thanks for watching.